First of all, I will tell you why we will heat a mountain to a temperature of about 300 degrees Celsius. We know about these large solar stations consisting of a lot of solar collectors in Denmark and other European countries. A similar solar station turned solar energy into heating a liquid with a temperature of about 60 or 90 degrees Celsius, and this solar heat is used for district heating of European cities, for space heating of city apartments and for their hot water supply. Unfortunately, these solar collectors produce the majority of the heat in the summer, while a city needs a lot of heat in the winter, for its space heating. That is why some solar stations have similar heat storage which is an artificial lake that is covered with thick thermal insulation, and the function of their lower thermal insulation is performed by this thick layer of soil. Those solar collectors gradually heat this water up to 90 degrees Celsius during the summer, and this thick thermal insulation keeps this temperature right up until the winter when the heat goes into the city, and therefore the water temperature will decrease below 35 degrees. This is also a Danish solar station, and it is used to simultaneously produce electricity and district heating for one of the small Danish towns. Solar radiation from these mirrors heats the thermal oil inside these receivers to over 300 degrees Celsius. So let this hot oil gradually heat up our mountain to 300 degrees Celsius during the summer, and then we will use this thermal energy for district heating of a city in winter. This video will prove that the cost of such transfer of thermal energy from summer to winter can be about 1 euro cent per kilowatt hour, and it is 3 or 5 times cheaper than the cost of the heat transfer by similar heat storages. In addition, my first YouTube channel with this name describes various solar heaters which can lead to the cost of our solar heat at the level of half an American cent per kilowatt hour, but it will be in a sunny desert climate and the cost of our solar heat in the climate of northern Europe will be more, and it will be about 1 euro cent per kilowatt hour. Thus, our hot mountain will provide solar heat at a cost of about 2 euro cents per kilowatt hour, and this is 3 or 5 times cheaper than the current prices of natural gas in Europe, or 5 times cheaper than district heating prices for Danish households. So, let's drill such horizontal wells inside which we will install pipes for the circulation of the hot oil from our solar station, and this circulation during the summer months will heat up our mountain to 300 degrees Celsius. But maybe it will be cheaper to make an artificial mountain because we get rid of the need to drill expensive wells, and our pipes can be easily and simply installed during the construction of our artificial mountain. Let our artificial mountain have such a shape and such dimensions. It will have this volume, and it is one and a half times the volume of this famous pyramid of Cheops, but the height of this pyramid is one and a half times the height of our artificial mountain. Let our mountain be heated by this solar station which has mirrors with a total area of more than two square kilometers. This solar station is located in the desert of Arizona, but we are moving it to the location of our artificial mountain in Denmark. The end of this video will show you that the thermal energy from this solar station and our hot mountain is enough for 100% district heating of a city with a population of 70,000 people. It could be more than half of this large Danish city, or it could be almost all of this city. The lower thermal insulation of our heat storage is this thick layer of soil between our mountain and this groundwater, but the lower limit of our thermal insulation has the right to fall below the groundwater provided that the water velocity is low or its flow is small. Some of our mountains will be forced to use these few meters of their bottom as the lower thermal insulation, and not as the heat storage. My following calculations think that our lower thermal insulation is this layer of soil 10 meters high, between this groundwater and this mountain. And these are the results of my approximate calculations of heat leaks through the lower thermal insulation. Any person can quickly check my calculations with this widely known formula, and this column will be explained in 4 minutes. It's interesting that these heat leaks for 12 months take only 2% of the annual heat production of this solar station if it is located in Denmark. The thermal insulation of the sides of our mountain is this additional layer of soil with a thickness of about 10 meters. This additional layer can have a complex structure, for example like this, and this layer of clay is impervious to rainwater, and this layer of fertile soil is needed for vegetation on the sides of our mountain, 
and we understand that when the middle of our mountain has a temperature of 300 degrees, the temperature here is a little more than 100 degrees, and here the ground temperature is only a few degrees above the ambient air, although here it could be 10 or 20 degrees more. This is my rough estimate of heat leaks through the 10 meter soil layer on the sides of our mountain, and these heat leaks take away 3% of the annual heat production of the Danish version of this solar station. I want to warn about the need for research on the impact of rainwater, but perhaps this factor will not have a big impact due to the natural evaporation of moisture from the surface of our mountain and the escape of rainwater from our slopes. To take into account the impact of rainwater, I slightly increased this coefficient, and in addition 40 seconds ago I suggested this solution where this layer of clay is waterproofing. It is important to note that this additional soil layer increases our mountain to these dimensions, and therefore its volume increases by 41%, up to this value. Of course, we can look for a more optimal shape for our artificial mountain, for example like this, and we can remember that among the Egyptian pyramids there is this analog. This is another example, and here we can place greenhouses which protect the center of our mountain from rainwater in summer. It's obvious that the greenhouses will be heated by these heat losses in winter, and maybe I will analyze this idea in more detail in one of my future videos. But let's get back to this shape and these dimensions of our artificial mountain, and this is my rough estimate of the total construction cost of our artificial mountain. Let's analyze this row, and it is obvious that this value will be different for different excavation technologies and it will be the cheapest for the case if we take the soil near our mountain with an excavator. We can use this layer several meters thick, and 5 million cubic meters of our mountain requires taking this layer from the area of about 1 square kilometer where we can then locate some part of our solar station. The use of dump trucks can significantly increase this cost, but this cost can be drastically reduced if our mountain is used as a dumping ground for waste from mining or waste from some plants and factories. Now let's analyze this row, and the bulk of the pipes for hot oil can be located approximately like this. Or this way. Or like this, perpendicular to the plane of this drawing, and the interval between adjacent pipes will be approximately 1 meter. In addition to these central pipes, we must use these pipes under our mountain, and these pipes under that layer of the ground thermal insulation, and the interval between these adjacent pipes is less than 1 meter. These peripheral pipes are used to take heat from our mountain for the district heating of our city. In other words, the thermal oil circulates through these peripheral pipes where the oil is heated by the hot soil and then transfers this heat through a heat exchanger to the water which is moving to our city for its district heating. The extraction of the thermal energy through these peripheral pipes from the soil leads to a radical decrease in the soil temperature, and therefore usually we will have a situation where the center of our mountain has a higher temperature than this soil temperature at the periphery of our heat storage and the movement of heat in these directions through several tens of meters of soil thickness is very slow due to poor thermal conductivity of soil. These temperatures of the periphery of our heat storage were shown in my previous tables in these columns, and it is obvious that the lower these temperatures, the less these thermal leaks from our heat storage. However, there are three reasons why we should take thermal energy for district heating of our city also from these central pipes. The first reason arises from the fact that these peripheral pipes usually cannot provide the power we need, and therefore our thermal oil is first heated in these peripheral pipes, and then it goes through these central pipes, and after that the oil goes through a heat exchanger where the oil transfers its thermal energy to water for the district heating. The second reason arises in February and March, when our mountain has already given up almost all of the summer thermal energy and therefore its temperature has drastically decreased, and it is obvious that now we have to take the rest of the thermal energy through these central pipes. The third reason may be for the case if our central pipes are not installed in this way, but like this, perpendicular to the plane of this drawing, and this third reason relates to the following idea of radically reducing the thermal losses from our heat storage. Let our mountain have not only these central pipes and these peripheral pipes, but also these inner peripheral pipes. 
If we extract the thermal energy through these inner pipes, our heat storage is reduced to this volume when the thickness of this layer of our thermal insulation is no longer 10 meters, but 15 meters, and the area of this surface of our new heat storage is reduced by approximately 20% compared to the surface of this old heat storage. Therefore the thermal leaks from this new heat storage are almost two times less than those described in these tables, and we use this new heat storage for seven months of every year from January to July, but August requires the start of the heat extraction from these peripheral pipes, as a result of which our heat storage increases to this volume. It's interesting that we can avoid spending money on these inner pipes because they can be replaced by the heat extraction through the central pipes located in the areas which is now painted green. Thus, in November we take heat for the district heating of our city through these pipes, in December through these pipes, and in January we are switching to these pipes, as a result of which our heat storage is reduced to this volume. This situation continues for the next four months, February, March, April, and May, but in June we switch to these pipes, and this is July, and then we are switching to heat extraction from these peripheral pipes, and we do this for the next three months, in August, September, and October. Now let's think about where the hot oil goes after our solar heaters, and it is obvious that this hot oil goes through these central pipes of our mountain, where the oil transfers its thermal energy to the soil of our heat storage, and after that the oil is returned to the solar heaters for reheating. But sometimes the hot oil after these solar heaters will go not only through these central pipes, but also through these peripheral pipes and the need for the oil cooling by the peripheral pipes arises from the following three reasons. First, the peripheral pipes cool the oil to a lower temperature, and this cooling increases the efficiency of our solar heaters, because the lower the temperature of the oil inside the solar heaters, the greater their efficiency, especially during the weak sun in winter, or in the morning and evening, and also in semi-cloudy weather. The second reason occurs in August, September and October, when the center of our heat storage is already heated to almost 300 degrees Celsius. This is not a problem in the morning and evening, or in semi-cloudy weather, when the thermal capacity of this solar station is only a few hundred megawatts, however solar noon increases its thermal capacity to about 1000 megawatts, and unfortunately this soil with a temperature of 300 degrees is not able to take those 1000 megawatts from the oil with such a temperature only through the central pipes, and therefore the hot oil first goes through the central pipes, then it goes through the peripheral pipes and returns to the solar heaters for reheating. Unfortunately, this leads to a noticeable heating of the soil near the peripheral pipes, and this effect was shown in my tables here. The third reason arises in the case of an abnormally sunny summer, due to which our heat storage is overflowing with thermal energy in August or September, and therefore we will be forced to direct new energy into these soil layers through the peripheral pipes. However, let's get back to the district heating of our Danish city of 70,000 people, and that's why I am showing you this table. This column describes the heating needs of our city and we see that the needs in winter are about four times more than the summer needs, because in summer we only need hot water and do not need space heating. Obviously, I rewrote this column from those of my tables on thermal leaks through the lower inside thermal insulation of our heat storage. This column describes the heat production from our solar station and we can see that its heat production in the summer months is almost ten times its winter heat production, and we can also see that 5% of our heat production will be lost here due to thermal leaks from our hot mountain. It's obvious that if this column is less than the sum of these two columns, the temperature of our heat storage decreases, and I wrote this decrease here. But here the heat storage temperature increases because this heat input from our solar heaters is more than the sum of these two columns. An analysis of these columns allows us to understand where this heat from our solar station goes, and this diagram explains these processes better, and I have already said that this 5% of the heat is lost through thermal leaks from our heat storage. This 46% is summer thermal energy that was stored by our mountain until winter, more precisely, this thermal energy enters our heat storage from April to September, and leaves it from October to March. 
These remaining 49% of the heat are produced by our solar station both in summer and winter, but they almost immediately go to the city, perhaps briefly stopping in our heat storage for several hours or days. Now we pay attention to these 46%, and here I wrote the cost of their transfer from summer to winter in our heat storage, and we see that it is a little more than 1 euro cent per kilowatt hour. This is the formula for the total cost of all our thermal energy, and we understand that these sales of heat to our city require this production of heat, this transfer of heat from summer to winter, and these other expenses. I remind you that this cost of our heat is several times cheaper than natural gas and other alternatives, but now it does not yet take into account the cost of delivering our heat to consumers. In addition, I should clarify that these expensive solar heaters will produce slightly more heat than what is written here, especially during the summer months. This table showed the heat production for less efficient solar heaters from my first YouTube channel with this name, and I remind you that these solar heaters are not yet ready so that we can confidently say that they provide heat at the cost of half a cent per kilowatt hour.